of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Our reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. This is the reading for Christ the King Sunday coming up. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Dear Christian friends, our reading today from Ephesians talks about Christ's regal office. That is, it talks about the kingship of Christ. And it's a very interesting reading if you look at it closely and analyze it. It begins with talking about the faith and love of the community. And then it starts to talk about the hope that those of the community have, the believers, in Christ. And it lays out three predicates that Christ has. Christ has power. Christ has dominion. And Christ has fullness or completeness. That is to say, that Christ has authority over all things. It's a wonderful hymn of thanksgiving. And it's wonderful to see how this message, it must have been wonderful actually, see how this message uh, was heard by those early Christian believers. Because for most of those, it might not have seemed living in that time, in the political uh, context, as if, Christ was actually ruling over all things. So it's nice to be reminded of that. And perhaps that's why the Pope in 1925 thought it was uh, necessary to establish Christ the King Sunday as a, uh, as a day in the church here. Mussolini was in power in Italy, and the Pope wanted to make it clear and plain to all uh, that this, uh, uh, this day uh, uh, we commemorate the real over all things, who is Christ. Now, we Lutherans, we have to believe that, right? Because we believe in the ubiquity of Christ. Christ is everywhere, and being everywhere, uh, he's certainly here, right? Now, uh, we start in Advent next week. We talk about the foreshadowing of the Christ event, the foreshadowing of the Incarnation. We work through the whole church year, and we end on Christ the King Sunday, which for whatever reason, isn't celebrated like it could be. I mean, this is the consummation of it all. This is what everything's heading for, right? Christ is king. Now, uh, as we think about Christ, we go all the way back to uh, Asibius of Caesarea, who uh, said that, you know, there's a threefold office that Christ has. Christ is prophet, priest, and king. And the old Lutheran dogmaticians made much of this. They distinguished Christ in his prophetic office as the one who teaches, does miracles, and tells us what needs to be done in order for us to be saved. Christ in his priestly or sacerdotal office is actually doing the saving, right? He is a sacrifice for all so that they all might be saved. And then finally, Christ in his regal office is the one who has power now, right? Christ in his regal office. And these Lutheran dogmaticians, writing in the uh, 17th century, basically, further subdivided the regal office into three kinds of power. Christ has power in the world, right? 
Christ is also uh, the king in the realm of grace, which would be in the church militant. That's the church in the world. So Christ not only has power in the civil order, but in the ecclesiastical order in the world. And then, of course, Christ also is king of the church triumphant. That is to say, Christ is the king in glory. So these dogmaticians uh, uh, would talk about Christ's uh, kingship in terms of power, in terms of grace, and in terms of glory. And if you look at Ephesians here, I mean, that's certainly consistent with what our reading is. I mean, Christ is king everywhere, right? If Christ is ubiquitous, that is everywhere, and he's king, well then everywhere where you're at, Christ is king. Now, at this point, one could ask, well, is Christ king for us, <laughs> right? Is Christ really king in the earthly order, really king in the ecclesiastical order, order and really clean king, pardon me, in eternity? Or are we just fooling ourselves? And here, of course, we Lutherans love to talk about law and gospel. And here is a great example of the same thing being law and gospel. Because, you know what? If the world's going pretty well, if I'm doing well uh, in the world, and my needs are being met well, and I have plenty of means, and I have health, and I can do what I want, and all of those good things, you know, I don't really probably deep down want Christ to be king. I'm doing pretty well, and I'm kind of afraid if that guy gets to be king, I might not be doing so well. And uh, if I'm in the church, and my church has the right political opinions, my church has the right moral ideas, that it's standing for the disadvantaged and the marginalized, that it's feeding the poor, clothing the naked, right? Uh, it may be that I don't really want Christ there to be head of the church either because, I mean, the church is doing a good job, right? I'm not sure I want Christ to be head of the church if the church is actually doing a great job. Of course, we have a long history of talking about the church as a... Uh, moral kingdom, and if it's working well, well, gee, what do I need Christ for? He seems to be kind of a superstitious guy. And you know what? If I've done pretty well in life, and uh, I can talk myself into the idea that when I die, I die, and that's it, you know, I don't really need Christ to intrude after my death, right? Because when I die, I'm dying. So, Christ coming up in these ways can seem to be pretty bad news for me if I'm pretty confident and secure about my life, my church, and what happens to me when I die. But you know, if I'm not so sure about these things, if I look out and I see that the world seems to be doing uh, some things that I don't like, well, there's disasters and famines all the time, but it looks like there's an economic meltdown in Europe, perhaps, or could be. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen uh, here exactly. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with China, for instance, and we start to worry about this, then it can be kind of good news. Well, you know, Christ is the king. And if I look at my church and I see that it's all splintered and it seems like there's no unity and it seems like this guy's going this way and this guy's going this way and these two guys that used to like each other don't talk to each other because this guy's going this way and this guy's going that way. It's kind of nice to be reminded that Christ is king of the church. And finally, uh, if I'm dying and I want to live and I'd like to live and death is a really bad news to me, it's kind of nice to be reminded that Christ is the king of eternity. Now, my friend, I don't know where you find yourself this morning. I don't know if the kingship of Christ is good or bad news for you. But I should tell you that it should both be very bad news and both be very good news. Because this is how it works. Christ has come to this world to announce some very bad news to those of us who are secure and complacent. 
of very good news to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And it just so happens that the same news is both very bad and very good to all of you, to each and every individual. So think of it. Christ is king. Now, in the political order, Christ is king. Now, in the ecclesiastical order, and Christ is king forever in eternity. May the grace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.